I was brought up in the South, and I never knew the difference between Negro gospel music and country music. It all was just music to me. Either it's good or it's bad. Either you like it or you don't. Hi, I'm Michael Bate, and that was Graham Parsons from an interview we did in Boston in March of 1973, just at the end of his tour with Emmy Lou Harris and the Fallen Angel Band. Graham and I met at the Boylston Holiday Inn, just a line drive from Fenway Park. And the first thing we talked about was how Graham hooked up with Roger McGuinn and the Birds in 1968. More Chris Hillman was responsible for sort of talking Roger into it. He had an affinity for country music. He's a very good country musician. And, and uh, I think about the only sort of country thing that they did was Satisfied Mind. But Roger, you know, he, he's tried everything from John Coltrane licks to uh, Modal Mountain Minor licks and, and things. And, uh, I, don't, I don't know how happy he is with the country music that they do now, but at the time, it seemed like a very good thing to get into, you know, because the birds were getting nowhere. But the birds were still one of the top rock bands in America. So it says a lot about Graham's vision, his concept of rock and country music, that at the age of only 21, he took control of the band and he grabbed the wheel and headed straight for Nashville. And they recorded Sweetheart of the Rodeo, which became one of the all-time influential albums in rock music. But before Columbia Records could release the album, Graham's former manager, Lee Hazelwood, threatened to sue Columbia. Hazelwood claimed he still had Graham under contract. So McGuinn panicked and rushed back into the studio and started erasing Graham's vocal tracks. (laughs) And uh, you're still on my mind. We're originally just jams that we did in the studio. Um, they just stuck them on the album at the last minute because they had erased my voice off oh, also you don't miss your water um, I came up with and, and uh, they erased my voice off that and off of um, Christian Life and off of A Hundred Years From Now because they were afraid of being sued by Lee Hazelwood who was the the guy who owned the label that the International Submarine Band was on. I don't know if you're aware of that group at all, but that was the first group I was in, yeah. And although I had been completely released, Marty Machette, who was a lawyer for Lee Hazelwood, was also the lawyer for Columbia. And so he started burning the candle at both ends, saying, I'm going to sue you and I'm going to sue you. And Columbia sort of freaked out and said, oh, I don't know what to do. And so they started erasing my vocal tracks. And McGuinn and Hillman would combine their voices and try to sound like me. But the last thing that they came to was Hickory Wind, and finally somebody came in and stopped them from erasing that. He he sort of has this thing of anybody who's single-minded, he can't take it. When when you're when he runs across somebody won't follow the directions, you know. Somebody who says, no, I I won't do that. He figures that you're trying to set your own trend or something, and he wants to be the leader. The highlight of Graham's brief career as a member of the Birds came in March of 68, when the band appeared on the Grand Old Opry. That was a hostile crowd, because the Birds were a rock band, long-haired hippies, trespassing on hallowed country ground and they got booed when they went on stage. Tom Paul Glazer and the Glazer Brothers were hosting the Opry at that point, and the condition that they let us do it on was we were going to do our single, You Ain't Going Nowhere. And then I was going to do a Merle Haggard song because they wanted me to do something that the audience could identify with, you know, seeing that they were going to have these long hairs on the Opry. And even though our hair was short at that period, we were considered long ears because they knew. They think they're really being big hearted just because they patronize guys like Christofferson or, um, you know, one or two guys with long hair or three. <laughs> but uh, they're really not very open minded in Nashville. No, you know, 
I mean, some of the best musicians in the world still are starving to death in Nashville. I, I got on, and Tom Paul Glazer, who's really a prick, man, he, he says, uh, and now here's Graham Parsons singing Merle Haggard's famous Sing Me Back Home. And I got out, and my grandmother was in the audience, right? Because my part of my family's from Tennessee, right around there. And I said, uh, well, instead of doing that song, I'm going to do a song that I wrote for my grandmother. And it's called Hickory Wind. And we did that, and the Glazer Brothers just flipped out, and they were yelling at us from off stage and stomping up, and that Roy Acuff was having fits and stuff. And Skeeter Davis ran up after it was all over and kissed us. <laughs> she was so happy somebody had blown those guys off. You know? And uh, it's funny that, we should, that I should have done Streets of Baltimore because I didn't know that one of the Glazers had written it. Back in the early 70s, Waylon Jennings was being hailed as the next Elvis, but he never quite lived up to the hype, and Graham had a theory on why Waylon wasn't a superstar. I think Phil Spector, didn't he say something like he thought that Waylon Jennings could could be the next Elvis Presley, he, that he had, the, that he had the, uh, uh, the sexy sort of image and uh, uh, talking down to the girls and stuff. He really turns on chicks when he plays. And uh, he couldn't understand why he hadn't done it. The reason that he hasn't done it is because up until this point, he's been produced by like Chet Atkins, who you have to walk around the block to smoke a joint when he's producing, you know, go out in, in, the, in the car or something. Can you imagine a guy Waylon Jennings' age having to walk out in the parking lot and smoke a fucking joint? Just because Chet Atkins is producing, he doesn't approve of that kind of thing, you know? What it, talk about an antiseptic atmosphere to work in. God, if you can't get along with your producer, you, you really have a tough time. You know? It's amazing that he got any good records at at all, working with him. Two bad producers in a row for Waylon Jennings, Chet Atkins, and then like the guy that I worked with, and I know he's bad. He's really a prejudice. Uh, 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 Lee Hazelwood. I, he, 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 he thinks that he knows everything because he cut a couple of Dwayne Eddy hits and a couple of Nancy Sinatra hits. I once, I, I, I don't know if I should be proud of this or, or keep it a secret, but when I was on his album, I, label, I really wanted to get off and, uh, get off the label. And, uh, I, I, uh, picked up every single that his label had put out and with the exception of one or two things by Virgil Warner there was a stack of singles like that and I listened to every one of them every side of them and I couldn't get the guy on the phone it was one of those scenes when you can't get a guy on the phone you know that something's weird and I took all the singles and laid them on his desk with a note that said listen man I've listened to every one of the singles your company's put out and they're all garbage and I went off. And he called me into his office to make a public apology to him. And I said, okay, I'm sorry, I went off. <laughs> he said, all right, God damn it, you don't know anything about making singles. You never cut a hit record in your life. And you can get off, but I'm keeping the name. I said, okay, you can have the name. Just let me out. Let me out of here. He's messed up too many people already. And, and as far as him producing Waylon Jennings, that's a joke. Waylon knows more about music than Lee Hazelwood could dream up in a million years. I hung out with Keith Richards for a while, uh, for a couple of months in London. I had met him several times before on an earlier bird tour in Europe. And Keith and I had an affinity for country music. He really loved it. And we started playing it. And, and then finally he had to go to L.A. to mix Beggar's Banquet. And I was broke. They had left me penniless there. And Keith said, well, that's okay. Come on, I'll, I'll fly you over there. And we came back to L.A. And I had been talking with Chris Etheridge about starting a group. So Chris and I started playing 
around together sitting in with various groups like the Main Street Blues Band, which was the beginning of Delaney and Bonnie's band. And um, that was Jimmy Carstein and J.J. Cale and Leon Russell and Jesse Davis, people like that. And finally, Chris Hillman came around and said, look, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't want to go to South Africa either. It was the wrong thing to do. Uh, and uh, I think I'll quit the birds and join you guys. I said, fine. Two guys named Chris in the group, why not? Next thing we had to do was find a steel player. And about the only steel player in town at that, that moment who wasn't really strictly into working country bars and staying in L.A. was Sneaky Pete. And we got a hold of Sneaky. And we did the album Gilded Palace of Sin with several different drummers. And then after that, we decided to incorporate Michael, Car Michael Clark into the group. And so we wound up with Michael Clark as a drummer. Burrito Deluxe was the sequel to Gilded Palace of Sin. And I asked Graham what he thought about the second Burrito's album. There was an up-tempo feeling to Burrito Deluxe, but I don't feel that there was a whole lot of music on the album, really. That was when I started to get a bit disenchanted with the Flying Burrito Brothers and started looking for something else to do, but I was still under contract to A&M, so uh, that was one of the things that Alpert and Moss told us when we signed. They said, listen, uh, don't worry. Remember, we had Waylon Jennings, and one day he just came in and said, man, I can't make it anymore. I just can't work for your company, and we let him go. So I tried that. <laughs> I came and said, man, listen, I can't make it anymore. I just can't work for your company. And they said, that's too bad. You're under suspension. <laughs> I said, fuck you. I'm going to England. <laughs> See ya. I wasn't interested in the direction they were heading. Sort of country rock, um, kind of a Poco sort of feeling, you know? Not, not so much. I, I think Poco has improved quite a bit now and improved upon what they were doing, but their, their first things you know, didn't, didn't knock me out too much. I love Richie Furet's singing, and I think he's a talented cat. I've known him for years. We practically grew up together in the village. He instills in us. But um, I felt that Jim Dixon was pushing the group into sort of a really ultra, super commercial kind of trip where it sounded sort of like uh, you know, uh, some of the worst things that the birds did while I was with them. You know, to just the, anything to get an up-tempo beat, anything to make it sound happy and sunny. and you know, it, ha it had no meat to it. It had no thought behind it. it. It really didn't mean anything. I like the first Burrito album, Killed a Palace of Sin, and I like just about everything on it. Everything. Of all the rumors surrounding Graham's life, one you hear most often is that the Stones song, Wild Horses, was in fact written by Graham, and the Stones ripped him off, never gave him credit. So to set the record straight, I asked Graham about the origins of Wild Horses. So the first time I heard it was the night after Altamont. After, well, we were all, you know, just shaking from the whole experience. and. They were leaving the next day, or at least uh, Mick was, to uh, take his suitcase of money to Switzerland. <laughs> and and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and he said, I want you to hear this song, man, because I think it's something that you might be interested in. And he played me Wild Horses and Brown Sugar. And I, I really dug it. They recorded them in Muscle Shoals about a week, two before. And I dug it. And... It was a couple of months later, I got a call from him, and he said, uh, if I send you the master, will you put a steel guitar on it? And I said, sure, I will. You know, and he sent me the master, and I got Denny Cordell to produce it, and we went into the record plant, and I got Leon Russell in there. And somebody came in with some sort of strange dust, and things just went haywire. The engineer forgot where he was, and things like that and uh, <laughs> so they didn't use that that track and I asked Mick if we could put it on our next album if we didn't release it as a single and he thought about it and said all right and then they didn't release it I think for almost a year after that 
I don't know why it's a beautiful song. GP was the title of Graham's first solo album, and was also the first time anyone had ever heard of a singer by the name of Amy Lou Harris. I, I've been looking for somebody with a high enough voice to sing with for a long time. Like Norman has a really high voice, but he's not. You know, it's, it's weird to try to do duets with somebody who's standing, sitting in back of you, and you can't see him. So he he does great harmony work. But you need somebody who's there playing a guitar with you that you can look at. And it's, and it's especially great with a girl because you can do love songs and stuff like that. And doing a love song with some guy with a high voice gets a little bit weird sometimes. <laughs> and most of the guys with real high voices who do that kind of work are a bit strange. <laughs> I'll leave that at that. <laughs> I was just very lucky. I was in Baltimore. The burritos had two more gigs to play as the Flying Burrito Bros with Chris Hillman and everything. And one was in Charlotte and one was in Baltimore. And they uh, called me in New Orleans and asked me if I'd like to come up and play the last couple of gigs with them. I said, sure, why not? You know, because Byron Berlin was there. and. Uh, bunch of guys that play bluegrass and stuff and I thought it'd be fun and Chris happened to mention to me when I was there he said you know we were in Washington a while back and I heard this chick singer said she's she's nothing but a folk singer but she could probably be developed into a really good country singer well Chris didn't know she was from Birmingham Alabama <laughs> and that she knew more about country music probably than both of us did and uh, she, 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 it took a little bit of getting together, but like, I called her up and she said, sure, come on down. And I met her at the train station and she took me to over to her house and we sat in the kitchen and I knew the first duet, I, I was thinking to myself, okay, well, let's see if she can cut it or not. So I thought of one of the hardest country duets I could think of to do, which was, um, that's all it took. And she just sang like a bird, man, and I, I, I said, well, that's it. <laughs> and I sang with her the rest of the night, and she just kept getting better and better. The more I looked at her, she's got fantastic eye contact. She can sing anything that you're doing in perfect harmony as long as you look at her, you know, and, and if you raise your eyebrows, if you're going up on a note, she goes right up with you in perfect pitch. Man. She's beautiful. Over the years, Graham has been eulogized as the patron saint of country rock, which is ironic because he never believed in musical labels, and he hated the term country rock. I think pure country includes rock and roll. I don't think that you have to call it country rock any more than you have to call something folk rock. It's, e it's either you can call it rock and roll or you can call it country music. I, I just don't like the label country rock. I was brought up in the South, and I never knew the difference between Negro gospel music and country music. It all was just music to me. And I knew the difference in the sound and the difference in how to play it. But and I, I was taught to play music by black people. But I was never aware that one was called gospel or rhythm and blues, or blues and rhythm as it used to be called and the other was called country and western. I, did, I never understood that. And I just never, I, I've never been able to get into the le further label of, of country rock. It just doesn't make sense to me. How can you define something like that? I just say that it's, it's music. Either it's good or it's bad. Either you like it or you don't. <laughs> 